good morning, uh, viewers and uh, listeners of Concerned uh, Citizens Media. Uh, thank you again for joining me. Uh, I always appreciate uh, you taking time to share uh, the news update. Uh, today is October 25th, 2022. I have several uh, news to share in reading and also uh, the news I selected from different uh, uh, YouTube media. So, as you already know, there is a, a peace talk between Ethiopian federal government and uh, Tigray region's authority in South Africa. But so far, uh, I checked different media, nothing came out yet, so we don't know. Uh, uh, it started already in South Africa, uh, so no news uh, yet uh, seen about that discussion or their agenda, nothing. The only thing we know, the Gray region sent uh, its representatives, led by uh, Geta Choreda, uh, Lieutenant General Tsadkan Gabratinsa, and other members. Also, the Ethiopian government uh, uh, sent a peace talk delegation to South Africa. This is already confirmed. Uh, Ambassador Ridwan and uh, uh, the, you know, uh, Timotheus, and others from uh, Ethiopia, uh, peace delegation will attend. Uh, Kenyan president, the former president, Kenyatta, also present. Uh, so that's the only thing we know. Both teams from Ethiopia and from the Tigray region uh, started the peace talk. Uh, and uh, we don't know what what the issues discuss, what agreement they have. So we expected maybe tomorrow, after tomorrow, we don't know. So that's the only thing we know. Let's see what uh, this uh, VOA uh, discussion about this peace talk. And then I will uh, uh, read... Uh, other news from Ethiopian government and uh, also some news I got from Addis Standard, plus uh, a victory for, uh, you know, Oromos uh, for, uh, you know, one more advancement in the United States, teaching the Afan Oromo language in uh, Stan Stanford, Stanford uh, University. This is a huge achievement. So I have that news too, I'll read that. So let's start with this uh, VOA reporting about the peace talk and why the peace talk is necessary and other details. Let's listen to that then. I will come to reading part. Just mentioned that the, the peace talks have been called to South Africa, mediated by uh, the uh, African Union, although we don't know the venue yet. But the question is, what is at stake in South Africa, and what are these talks all about? And this is the moment when I turn to uh, Paul Lantulia, who is a researcher, special, a research specialist at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. He is joining me via Skype from here in Washington. And Paul, I want to begin just right there. Uh, first, why? What is at stake in these talks as the uh, warring parties now meet in South Africa? Well, uh, thank you, Vincent. It's great to be on the show once again. Um, no, as you've mentioned, uh, there's a lot at stake in this in this crisis. The first is uh, Ethiopia is a major African power, uh, very strategically located in the Horn of Africa, close to the Red Sea, plays a huge role in uh, regional security efforts, including counterterrorism, including stabilization efforts in Somalia. And Ethiopia has also for many years been one of the, among the top 20 fast, fastest growing economies, not just in Africa, 
uh, but the world. Ethiopia is the seat of the African Union. Ethiopia hosts many UN agencies, including the UN Commission for Africa. Ethiopia hosts uh, some of the security infrastructure of the African peace and security uh, uh, architecture, uh, and hosts uh, numerous, numerous diplomatic initiatives, uh, for instance, IGAD and others. So there's a lot at stake. There's a lot yeah. at stake. And, uh, for Ethiopia to be unstable is not good for the continent. Uh, now, many have been watching this uh, conflict go on, and the question has been, why is it or has it seemingly been very difficult to uh, bring the two sides together, get, a, get into a, a state of peace and at least a truce that could hold? Three reasons, Vincent. First is the severity of the conflict. This is an internal crisis and a power struggle within the, the TPLF, which was at the core uh, of the ruling coalition. The ruling coalition, uh, the coalition that ruled Ethiopia, from the overthrow of Mangistu up to 2018, had a violent split within it, which also affected the military. So the severity of the conflict is a, a major reason as to why it has been very difficult to get all these sides uh, to the table. I mean, Abi himself grew up in the TPLF-led coalition. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that uh, you've had multiple and in some cases competing and parallel peace initiatives coming from the external, uh, you know, from external partners. And when you have that, the protagonists in any conflict situation, they tend to play one mediator or the other. The third reason, Vincent, is that uh, the parties do believe for the moment that they can achieve their objectives on the battlefield. Yeah. Uh, and until you get to a situation where they believe that they can actually speak on the table in good faith, uh, it will be very, very difficult uh, yeah. to... Uh, to arrive at the truce. Now, very quickly, the African Union is mediating this uh, present, current talks. What is your assessment of the African Union's mechanism to resolve conflicts on the continent? It's been a little mixed uh, because uh, right from the beginning, uh, the uh, Tigray uh, elite and uh, the uh, leadership within the TPLF and the Tigray regional government have complained uh, that the African Union was not uh, was not impartial, given that uh, the uh, designated mediator, Olusegun Obasanjo, um, was seen to have legitimized uh, the elections uh, that took place, which were extremely controversial uh, from the perspective of the opposition, not just Tigray, but the larger opposition in Ethiopia. And so immediately from day one, the African Union process was not viewed as, as, as neutral uh, you know, and credible uh, by a party to the crisis. So that is the first. Uh, that is the first issue. The second issue is um, uh, it is very, very difficult, and we've seen this even before in the Mangistu years. Uh, there is a tradition within the African Union that uh, you know it, it, matters matters involved in conflict in Ethiopia tend to be very, very sensitive thank simply thank because thank of the AU. So it's very difficult. It's yes. definitely a conversation will continue, especially as the talks take place in South Africa. Thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, that is Paul Nantulia, who is a, a research specialist at the Africa Center uh, for Strategic Studies. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I will come back to this uh, video. Uh, that's about, uh, again, another prime minister for the United Kingdom. <clears throat> so, uh, the only thing I didn't agree on that discussion is Ethiopia is not the fastest growing economy under Abiy Ahmed, but it was before Abiy Ahmed came to power. Right now, everything is, uh, uh, you know, in a difficult situation, very difficult. High inflation, high unemployment, uh, and uh, the country is globally isolated. Uh, uh, this bloody war continues. So that statement uh, should uh, be adjusted. Ethiopia is not the fastest growing economy under Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Okay. Uh, the Ethiopian federal government uh, released this statement, you know, in one hand the government sent a peace talk delegation and on other hand they are uh, bombing the capital city of you know uh, Tigray region Makale and they are pushing uh, forward they are pushing forward to take control of more uh, territories 
uh, including the capital city. Even uh, the government media and uh, their uh, friendly media like Assad, uh, you know, they are reporting that uh, uh, the government is uh, uh, prepared or getting ready uh, transitional government uh, set up personnel about like 3,000 3,000 personnel to govern the Tigray region. Uh, uh, some police officers selected from Addis Ababa uh, and also some personnel from Addis Ababa and other regions selected or chosen to lead the Tigray region. So they are ready to form a transitional government. Uh, that's their dream. That's their intention. And uh, they are also uh, sending a delegation, you know, just maybe to satisfy the international community, not seriously to end this war. <clears throat> uh, this statement from the government, current situation update, it says, this is from the Ethiopian side. The Ethiopian National Defense has continued taking control of major urban centers in the past few days. The Ethiopian National Defense has succeeded in avoiding combat in urban areas while de debilitating the military capabilities of the TPLF. They didn't avoid urban area. They are bombing cities. And uh, civilians are dying, including children and the women. So this, they can say whatever they want. The government of Ethiopia is working in coordination with uh, humanitarian agencies to continue providing humanitarian aid in this area. It has also requested operators of essential service to expedite their preparation to resume service, services in these areas. The government is also exploring ways in which public administration and the social service in this area could begin in consultation with the local population. Yeah. Meanwhile, the government of Ethiopia will be participating uh, in the AU conveyed peace talks held in South Africa. The government of Ethiopia view the talk as an opportunity to peacefully resolve the conflict and consolidate the improvement of the situation on the ground brought about through the sacrifice of the Ethiopian National Defense Force. The delegation, the delegation of Ethiopia government uh, is in South Africa this morning. So that's a government communication uh, giving us uh, update, uh, ready to set up transitional government and also, as I say, to start the basic services and the humanitarian services. They can say a lot of nice things, but we'll see. So that's the update. From the government side. Uh, this is from Addis Standard. To drive peace talks delegation arrived in South Africa. Blinken speaks, speaks uh, with uh, the President Ruto, South Africa Foreign Minister Pondor. The peace talks delegation, composed of officials from Tigray Regional State, arrived in South Africa ahead of AU-led peace talks between Tigray and the federal government official. Earlier, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke with Kenya's President William Ruto and commanded his critical role in regional peace and security in Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa. He also spoke with South Africa's Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, Naledi Pandor on how to make Ethiopia peace talks successful. The arrival in South Africa of the delegation from Tigray was confirmed by Professor Kindia Gabrahiot, TPLF Central Committee member and a member of Tigray External Affairs Office. The delegation of the government of Tigray to attend the AU led peace talks on Ethiopia Tigray have just arrived at South Africa, pressing immediate cessation of hostilities, unfettered humanitarian access, and the withdrawal of Eritrean forces. 
There cannot be a military solution, Professor Kindiya tweeted. Uh, the government of Ethiopia viewed the talks as an opportunity to peacefully resolve the conflict and consolidate the improvement of the situation on the ground brought about through the sacrifice of the Ethiopian national defense, the statement said, and confirmed the delegation uh, is in South Africa. But source close to the matter told Addis Standard on condition of anonymity that the delegation is composed of a group of 10 and includes Ambassador Redouan Hussein, Security Advisor of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, Gideon Timotheus, PhD, Minister of Justice, Dr. Getacho Jambare, Deputy President of Amara Regional State, and Ambassador Hassan Abdul Qadir. Coordinated Prosperity Party Democratic System Office. And on, uh, as I said, on the grand side, the grand region side, Geta uh, Chorada, Sad Khan, Gavratensai, led the delegation. Peace talks amid growing call for cessation of hostilities. The planned peace talk. The second attempt by the AU is taking place today amid a growing global call for immediate cessation of hostilities between federal forces backed by Eritrean army and Amara regional militia on the one hand and the Tigrayan forces on the other and uh, for withdrawal of Eritrean forces from Tigray where they continue committing war crimes and crimes against humanity, according to the latest report. After discussing the conflict in Ethiopia, in a closed meeting on Friday, the UN Security Council failed to issue a statement unlike the AU Peace and Security Council, which is in a statement called for an immediate, comprehensive and unconditional ceasefire and uh, the resumption of humanitarian services on the same day the UN Security Council held a close meeting requested by the A3 member of the Council, Gabon, Ghana and Kenya, but failed to issue a statement. Yes, uh, I also reported on this one last time. Both the AU and uh, PC uh, Security Council and the United Nations Security Council met following a call by the chairperson of the African Union Commission, Musa Faki Mahmoud, for an immediate and conditional ceasefire and resumption of humanitarian service in the Tigray region. Similar call were also were also echoed by individual countries and the member states of the UN Security Council. U.S. representative to the U.N. Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield said it was past time for all the parties to lay down their weapons and return to peace. It is past time for cessation of hostilities and for unhindered humanitarian access for those in need. It is past time for Eritrean Defense Forces to halt their joint military offensive and for Ethiopia to ask Eritrea to withdraw its soldiers from northern Ethiopia. She also said over the, over the two years of fighting, as many half a million people have died, and the U.S. is deeply concerned about the potential further mass atrocities, and indicated that the U.S. is ready to take appropriate measures against those who obstruct resolution of this conflict and we are determined to have those who commit human rights abuse held to account. So that is uh, uh, the statement from U.S. State Department uh, Ambassador Linda Thomas, U.S. Representative at the United Nations and uh, serious warning for those who may be of, you know, creating obstacles. And uh, Eritrean withdrawal is repeatedly requested, you know, but they are still
still there. They are still bombarding the Tigray region. And uh, yeah, they are ignoring the international court because there is no consequence. There is no consequences. If there is a serious consequence, uh, they should have been left a long time ago. But they are still there. They are waging war and uh, killing civilians and uh, conducting all kind of atrocities in that region. <coughs> the, this is uh, about drone attacks in Oromia. Uh, this is uh, the region, you know, uh, hidden from the international community. Nobody is paying attention. Uh, very serious. The second serious war is going on in Oromia region. Uh, actually started before the war in Tigray, in Wollega and uh, uh, Gambia. Yeah. <sighs> Southern part of Oromia. So let me read. So this is statements or tweets from uh, Oda Terbi. OLF international person or spokesperson for OLF tweeted multiple times on the seriousness of these drone attacks and uh, the killing of students and uh, people returning from church, uh, people, uh, you know, uh, having a meeting, local meeting, uh, being killed by these drone attacks. So. The Abiy regime launched another drone strike in Gobi, uh, Chobi district yesterday, hitting a school and killing scores of students. The footage shows the aftermath of this heinous crime. The international community remains silent as the regime continued to butcher innocent people. Yes, there is a graphic image, but I don't want to show you. That's uh, uh, in, uh, under his tweet, or that term is tweet. If you go there, you will see students uh, butchered by Abi Ahmed uh, drones uh, he got from, I don't know, Iran, Turkey. We don't know where he got, but he's spending too much money on this thing to kill his own citizen. Oda Torbi continues. Uh, this piece of the Turkish Mam El munition found at the site, this is from Turkish, at a time of economic crisis and famine, the regime is spending over $25,000 per strike to massacre the people into submission. Regardless, there will be no escape from justice and accountability. 25,000 per each strike. And uh, you know uh, how Ethiopians are suffering from unemployment and high inflation, but this guy, just to secure his uh, uh, seat, his power, uh, spending $25,000 per each strike uh, to kill his own citizens. Uh, or to force uh, or almost under his uh, failed leadership. Uh, Oda Terbi continues, there have been six drone strikes in Oromia since October 20th. The targets have been densely populated urban areas, which has resulted in several hundred civilian killed. In West Shore alone, over 150 civilians have been confirmed dead as a result of drone strikes in Meta, Wolkite, and Kobe. He continues, The Abi regime cannot be allowed to indiscriminately bomb civilians with impunity. The failure of the international community and the lack of media coverage on the war in Oromia has given the regime, the green light, to butcher civilians to preserve its dictatorship. Hashtag Oromia, hashtag Ethiopia. So these are uh, the tweets from Oda Terbi, Oromo Liberation Army, 
uh, international spokesperson on the drones on the drones uh, used by Abi Ahmed uh, uh, both by you know by uh, Ethiopian limited resources one strike twenty five thousand dollar and killing civilians students and the worshippers and uh, other civilians so uh, Oda Terbi is calling on the international community, international media to pay attention and uh, to bring these people accountable. So we call again, concerned citizens media, call on uh, international uh, community, US, EU, UN to pay attention. Uh, or, you know, they are paying attention to Ukraine and the Tigray region which we appreciate but they are forgetting forgotten the uh, what's happening in Oromia very serious war bloody war in Oromia too and uh, Abiy Ahmed is uh, just using drones uh, and uh, the country's limited resources uh, just destroyed <laughs> this is from uh, Catholic news service about pop appeal Francis appeal for end to fighting in Ethiopia, Ethiopia's Tigray region. This is from his tweet. I follow the persistent situation of the conflict in Ethiopia with trepidation. Pope Francis had told pilgrims joining him October 23 for the midday recitation of the angels at the Vatican. Once again, I repeat with Heard felt concern that violence does not resolve discord, but only increases the tragic consequences, the Pope said. I appeal to those who hold political responsibility to put an end to the suffering of the defenseless population and to find equitable solution for lasting peace throughout the country. Pope Francis prayed that the efforts of those involved in their dialogue would lead to a genuine path of reconciliation and that everyone would offer their prayers, solidarity and humanitarian aid to our Ethiopian brothers and sisters who are so sorely tried. So, I appreciate, we appreciate the Pope for his effort. Uh, for calling for peaceful resolution. Credit, again, Catholic News Service. <clears throat> this is from US State Department briefing question and answer for an individual, I think, uh, Ms. Finn from TJ, TJ Ethiopia. I don't know what is TJ, but let me read. He's asking uh, need price uh, you know about the demonstration last time we saw in Addis Ababa and other parts of the country denouncing the United States and uh, blaming the United States uh, so he's asking about that and let's let me read okay say the questioner thank you Nid, for giving me the chance my name is Masfan from TG Ethiopia and my question is about Ethiopia here is my first question. The hundreds of thousands of Ethiopians gathered Saturday in Addis Ababa and other cities in Ethiopia to demand that the United States and other European countries stop their interference and pressure in Ethiopia's internal affairs. Some demonstrators even displayed banners accusing the United States of disrespecting Ethiopia's sovereignty. What is the State Department's response to the demonstrators' demand? Uh, Mr. Price says, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your question in terms of the demonstrators' demand. Uh, the questioner repeat, yes, they are accusing the United States disrespecting Ethiopia's sovereignty. They are saying that the United States is interfering in Ethiopia's internal affairs. So what is your response to that? Okay, need price, U.S. State Department response. Our response, of course, is that 
those claims are wholly inaccurate. They are wholly wrong. The interest of the United States is the interest of the Ethiopian people to see the resolution of peace, to see an end to the violence, to see a sovereign whole Ethiopia. And that's why we have supported the African Union-led talks. In fact, this African Union-led talks kick off in South Africa to address the ongoing conflict in northern Ethiopia that has cost so many lives, has led to atrocities, has led to bloodshed, has led to starvation, has aggravated so many underlying factors. We commend South Africa for hosting the talks. We stand ready to support the African Union High Representative Obasanjo and the AU panel members, former South African Deputy Prime Minister Milambo Niguka and the former Kenyan President Kenyatta in facilitating an agreement. So, yes, the demonstrators in Addis Ababa, in Bardar, in Gondar, Awasa, uh, Adama, Nakam, everywhere came out by prosperity later, forcing them, forcing them to show up and uh, to denounce the United States and other Western countries for uh, speaking up against this war, for calling for peaceful resolution. They blame them. They, you know, uh, they blame them as interference in the internal affairs and sovereignty of Ethiopia. There is no sovereignty where Eritrea and the Sudan is already uh, playing, you know, uh, damaging game, uh, taking territories from Ethiopia. So, <coughs> So the last one is about, I said, uh, about Afan Romo. Afan Romo uh, uh, started uh, being uh, taught in Stanford University. This is a huge achievement, really. It's a huge achievement for Oromos who sacrifice for uh, the development of this language. Uh, Afan Romo was uh, considered uh, like it's a language that that can break a radio if you spoken if you use that language in uh, so it was hated by ruling parties and uh, you know it, it was not allowed to develop to develop to develop in Ethiopian institution uh, you know yeah. and the individuals are encouraged to speak a fan uh, Amharic language to develop Amharic language. If you speak Afan Romo, you 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 will be considered like illiterate, backward. That was the situation. That was the situation, and uh, it didn't uh, get the, the opportunity, the opportunity to develop. And uh, but let me read what it says. That was the situation. It was tough. So it is it is. Uh, is another a milestone achievement for Oromos recognition, recognition. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we have little Oromia in Minnesota. That's another recognition, another recognition. This, ad, you know, recognition over recognition. Now we have Afan Oromo in uh, in Google. Google. You can get translation from English to Afan Oromo or Oromo to English. That's, it's, it's developing, it's growing, it's supposed to be, it's the, you know, the highest language spoken in Ethiopia. And uh, the people speaking is the majority in Ethiopia. So all this was covered, uh, hidden from the international community. Now it's growing, it's, uh, uh, you know, coming to the United States University, Stanford. We appreciate you for doing that. Other universities, universities in uh, Minnesota, they should work out. They have so many or almost there. They can, uh, you know, uh, demand 
the University of Minnesota and others to give uh, Afan Romo a chance. <coughs> Let me read what it says. This language was banned in Ethiopia just 30 years ago. Now it is being taught at Stanford. Afan Oromo, a native language of Ethiopia, is being taught at Stanford for the first time this fall as part of the Stanford Language Centers Africa and Middle East Language Program, AMELANG -A 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 offerings, AMELANG -A -A offerings. Ethiopia Emperor Haile Selassie banned Afan Oromo from being spoken, taught, or uh, administratively used in the country in order to subdue the Oromo people and the culture in 1941. After the ban was lifted in 1991, a push to give new life to the language began in and beyond Oromia and Ethiopia, led by native-born and diaspora Oromians as well as non-Oromians. This push has now reached Stanford campus. Among Stanford's sizable East African student population, Saron Samuel, 25, along with Eban Ibsa, Iban Ebisa, 25, told the Daily they sought to connect more with their heritage and put in a special language request last winter to get Afan Romo added as a class. While their request was initially denied, they were told if they got at least one more interested student, the class might get funding. The special language petition allows students to work with the university to add courses on less popular, popularly taught languages. Samuel sprang to action. I sent the form in multiple groups, chats, reached out to people I knew would be interested in taking the class and posted on social media, she said. When the two, when the two had three more students commit to the class, the Amelang program expedited funding and hired a new lecturer, Afan Oromo teacher Balai Bratu, during the summer. The university was able to add the course after a generous contribution from the Center for African Studies and in response to student request, according to coordinator of Stanford Ameling program, Kahalil Barohum. Afan Romo is offered in a three course sequence this year and will be the third Ethiopian language to be taught at Stanford along with Amharic and Tigrinya. I didn't know that. The green is included. This is the first time I know. Amaric, maybe. <clears throat> Bratu told the Daily that he first learned the language secretly in the 80s. He and other interested learners would meet in secret to explore the language. Although he was eventually caught teaching it to younger students and was punished severely for his actions. Bratu said he believes it was worthwhile because he know he now gets to continue to teach the language and the culture to those who seek it. See? Those are the pressure. They don't allow you to speak your own language at school compared when you are playing with uh, your classmate. If the director cut you, you will be punished just for speaking your own language. In general, my view on teaching Afan Oromo is about doing justice to the culture. It is not against anyone or any group. 
It is about doing justice to the people who are using this language as their mother tongue, he said. It is my passion and honest conviction that teaching language is doing justice to human culture, as the professor Bratu. Bratu began this quarter's class with an introduction of the sounds in Afan Oromo. Unlike English, Afan Oromo is a phonetic language and the pronunciation is integral to its mastery, he said. He continues by teaching vocabulary, grammar, and other foundation blocks of language teaching. Bratu and his students consider themselves to be pioneers who are paving the way at Stanford for a greater appreciation and utilization of Afan Oromo. Credit the Stanford Daily. So there's, the story is very long. If you are interested, you can get it from Standard, uh, Stanford Daily. Uh, it is more than uh, three, four pages. So it's, 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 uh, it's uh, very interesting, very inspiring, and also is a uh, is 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 a it's a development. It's a development. It's an opportunity uh, gives given to Oromos and the recognition for Oromo language. So we appreciate Stanford Stanford University, and we encourage others to join. Stanford University, especially in Minnesota area, uh, because the Oromo community over there is uh, numerous, and uh, they should demand, they should ask uh, for you know the Oromo community to be included in uh, university curriculum. So that's you know it's as I said, it is a recognition for those who sacrificed a lot including their life, who punished, tortured for speaking the language, for attempting to develop this language. So that's a recognition for those who sacrificed and a recognition for Oromos in uh, general. So we appreciate, we appreciate who contributed, who uh, all these Bratu and his students, uh, they did uh, great service for the Oromo community. So we appreciate them. Thank you. That's the end of the reading. I have a couple of uh, videos and I'll conclude today's presentation. Let's see. For a party which has ousted two of its own prime ministers in the past year, there was a remarkable veneer of camaraderie for the arrival of PM number three at party headquarters in London. Just seven weeks after being beaten in the previous leadership contest, Rishi Sunak emerged unopposed as the Conservative Party's chosen one. He won't officially become Prime Minister until asked by King Charles in the coming days. So Sunak limited himself to a brief TV statement of acceptance. The United Kingdom is a great country, but there is no doubt we face a profound economic challenge. We now need stability and unity, and I will make it my utmost priority to bring our party and our country together. Mr. Sunak, During the final hours of haggling and campaigning, the momentum of Sunak's campaign became unstoppable, more than half the parliamentary party declaring their support for him. In the end, only he reached the required threshold of 100 nominations from fellow Conservative MPs. I can confirm uh, that we have received one valid nomination. <laughs> Boris Johnson's decision to quit the leadership race on Sunday came as a surprise. That left just Penny Mordaunt and Sunak in the contest. She resisted intense pressure to do a deal with Sunak and fought, literally to the last minute, to get past the threshold. But just seconds before the deadline, she too withdrew. Rishi Sunak had won. Arriving here in Downing Street, Sunak faces a daunting list of immediate challenges. There's the double-digit inflation, the soaring interest rates, there's the grim state of the public finances, and the deeply wounded and divided party that he now leads. Not to mention the question marks as to whether the Conservative Party actually has a mandate to govern anymore. 
Rishi Sunak was rejected by his own party membership only weeks ago. The people of this country now deserve us to go to the electorate to put our policies forward about how we're going to deal with this cost of living crisis that the Conservatives have put upon the British people and let them have a vote. Scary how we've kind of turned the page and continued down the same track. I'd like to see a Labour Prime Minister. Simple as that. We just need to get this sorted. We're looking at we're in embarrassment really. So, so the, like, uh, if you look at all the other foreign press about us, it's, we, we don't laugh as well. During the summer leadership contest against Truss, Rishi Sunak predicted many of the UK's current economic difficulties. The economic landscape has turned even bleaker since then. The country now waits to hear what its new leader and his government plans to do about it. Paul Brennan, Al Jazeera, Downing Street. The Dakar International Forum on Peace and Security in Africa opened its doors on Monday in the Senegalese capital. For two days, delegates and participants in the conference will focus on the continent's security challenges. The event is attended by ministers, the military and representatives of international organizations. Africa must make an effort on its own security. There must be African solidarity first before calling for foreign solidarity. Then we have to focus on the training of people, Africa's primary capital. We must take care of the youth. Senegalese President Macky Sall, current chairperson of the African Union, spoke at the opening ceremony of the event, which he hopes will support Africa's bid for a permanent seat on the G20 and the UN Security Council. For us, it is important that Africa positions itself, first of all, in terms of multilateralism. Africa needs to be like a giant and to be considered at the table of the Security Council and to have the right of veto, if necessary. For two days, participants will attend workshops to highlight how foreign shocks from outside of the continent impact on the security situation of African countries. The aim of these meetings is to seek solutions that will enable the continent to no longer rely on external support in terms of armed forces or food aid, for example, and to assert its sovereignty. Welcome the General Secretary and other Political Bureau Standing Committee members. No. It no, might have been expected, but the confirmation the was one. momentous nonetheless. President Xi leading his new team into a new era, an era where he'll remain in charge for as long as he sees fit. What the world watched today was an assertion of pure power. According to precedent, Xi served his 10 years and should now step down, but he'll stay for at least five more. This is a man with a vision, unafraid of what realizing it might mean. The journey ahead is president long in our life. Life with determined steps we will reach our destination. We will not be daunted by high winds, choppy waters or even dangerous storms, for the people will always have our back and give us confidence. He's now the most powerful leader here since Chairman Mao and those flanking him confirmed it. These men are at the apex of China's political system, a new top team stuffed with allies and loyalists, no clear successor, no hint of challenge. But Xi Jinping is a man with a mission. He is going to tighten control even more to make sure that the whole party and the whole country will be completely united in following his instructions and moving China in the direction that he has set. And the implications reach far beyond these shores, from political relationships redrawing the world order to policies that have impacted a global economy. His China is one to be reckoned with. What we've seen this week is no doubt an historic consolidation of Xi's power, but also of his vision for this country. It's a China that's stronger and more assertive, but it's also a place where dissent of any kind isn't tolerated. Any deviation from this path now feels increasingly unlikely. On a sunny Sunday in the capital, not everyone was paying attention to politics. In Xi's China, even passing comment comes with risk. But he has made this country richer and more powerful, and that's what people tend to focus on. Yeah. 
，越来越富强。我是绝对支持，觉得绝对是看好看好我们的国家。But there are occasional cracks, a sense that some still suffer. 那这个我希望政府能解决，但是政府都不多，知道哪个政府啊 ？The president's going to be in power for at least another five years, maybe longer. What do you think of that? 也难说，没人比你，有可能更好，<笑>是不是啊？有人比你，有可能更难。这个话就 ，When China moves, the world now listens. Its future for now feels fixed. Its fate largely in the hands of one man. Helen Ann Smith, Sky News in Beijing. Okay, so those are the videos I selected for today's update. And our Prime Minister is watching China and Russia to the closer uh, to China and Russia. Plus, Isaiah have worked over to, to stay in power permanently, crushing any dissent, any opposition, or any challenge. So that's uh, the situation. And uh, let me conclude by calling on the international community, United States, European Union, United Nations, other human rights organizations to pay serious attention and what is happening uh, in Oromia, especially Wollega and uh, also uh, the drone, the ongoing drone attacks in West Shoa uh, zone, uh, the killing of students, worshippers and other civilians. And they need to speak up. Uh, they need to uh, make this prime minister and his uh, associates accountable. Civilians are dying, suffering uh, under his uh, leadership. And the Ethiopians, they are silent because uh, they are forced to support him. Uh, you know, like uh, if freedom and opportunity is given for Ethiopians, they can easily remove him within a day. But there is no freedom like we have in uh, United States or United Kingdom. This is the third new, uh, I think, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, and now Mr. Uh, Sunak, Rushi Sunak. is uh, the youngest and also uh, from, I think, his parents from India. Uh, that's interesting. And uh, we wish him success. And, uh, you know, I, I like his commitment in his, on his speech. So, uh, at least they have a mechanism. If something goes wrong, they have the mechanism to remove the prime minister. In Ethiopia, we don't have that mechanism. That's why we see a lot of bloodshed, a lot of atrocities uh, in that country. Because the parliament doesn't have any mechanism to challenge the prime minister, you know, uh, they think he paid them, but they are taking the Ethiopian resources. The salary is paid by Ethiopians, but they think in mentalities, if they challenge him, they will lose the salary, they will lose their uh, life uh, or the privilege. That's that's, you know, uh, the thinking. They should uh, be encouraged, they should be encouraged to use the constitution to challenge him and to demand his resignation. To tell him enough is enough. Your leadership is a failure. Too much bloodshed under your leadership and the country is dying. So they have to. And uh, again, Please, the international community, pay attention what is happening in Oromia. International media and the human rights organizations, please pay attention what is happening in Oromia. Oromia is suffering. Oromia region is suffering under this uh, current uh, leadership. Please speak up. Please uh, make these people accountable. And uh, finally, I say, uh, I hope we will hear something uh, positive, good news from this peace, peace uh, talk.
in South Africa. Hopefully, I know Ethiopia is pushing to capture the capital city, uh, Makale. Uh, that is their dream. Uh, that, you know, that is a very serious for the Tigray region. Uh, it's a huge price to pay for the past mistake. They uh, returned from close, almost close from Addis Ababa. Shoarobit. They regret. They, I, I don't know who gave them that advice, but they will regret. They are, they are paying heavy price for that. And also the Oromos in Wollo paid a heavy price to uh, for that decision by TPLF. So I hope this will be uh, reversed and uh, peace will be uh, uh, restored in the Tigray region. All the suffering will end. These people suffer more than enough. Thank you for joining me. Uh, so please be safe and so long everyone. See you again.